Let's dive right in. This is an extension of the 5-minute figure tutorial that places points inside a volume using Blender version 3.4. In this video, we'll cover basic proximity distortion, and we'll be breaking down the nodes rather than building them up. As part of this, I will be releasing a more user-friendly and more advanced version of these nodes for free for anyone who wants to explore them. There will be a quick walkthrough for these nodes and their features at the end of the video, and a link for those is in the description. As usual, there are timestamps below. Our main goal here is to recreate part of this excellent journal cover that depicts work from the Mozzarella group involving the use of phase change memory materials, specifically germanium antimony tellurides. I'll put a link to the article in the description. What we want is the ability to displace spheres or any other object and assign them a color relative to some controller. We'll cover two ways to do that, one with empty controllers and one with objects. The second route also has some interesting uses for animation. As a quick overview, in this network we have an input geometry. We convert that to a volume, and then we use a distribute points and volume node set to grid to create all of the points. We use that to instance a simple UV sphere or other object, and further down the line we can set shade smooth and assign a material. To achieve the displacement, we just need to add a set position node before instancing the spheres. In this case, I am displacing all of the spheres using a noise texture. The first step is to add, using vector math, minus 0.5 to the x, y, and z values. This will keep the effect of the noise centered. From there, I can add a vector math scale node, and this will allow me to control the extent or the strength of the distortion. If I wanted to, I could then go and change the noise values or the scale to change the pattern. If you set the noise to 4D noise, you can use the w value here to animate. And to do this, you would very simply drag this out and look for a scene time node set to either seconds or frames. So if I go ahead, hit spacebar here, you can see this will play. You can also restrict which axes the noise operates in by using a vector math multiply node before the scaling. So I'll drag out from here, add a multiply node, and connect this right in there. If I then go ahead and change the axes values, for instance, one for all, you'll see that I have the noise. But if I were to get rid of the z value by setting it to zero, you can see now the noise will only operate in the x and y plane. And again, I can restrict that further, so you really have a lot of control over how the noise is going to appear. To confine the effect to a certain area, we're going to use a selection in our set position node, and we're going to use our selection based on the distance to some control object. We can do this using either an object or an empty. Let's start with the empty. Very simply, I have an object info node set to relative, and I'm selecting the empty that I want to work with, in this case, right here. I'm going to take the position of every point in this grid and using a vector math distance node, get the distance between all the positions and the location of the empty, again, making sure that it's set to relative. If I output this value right here, then this connects into a compare equals node. I'm comparing to a value of zero, and I'm using the epsilon as a measure of the control. So you can see with it set to the empty, I can move my empty around and the distortion will follow wherever the empty is within a certain range, and that range is defined by epsilon. This is essentially a distance calculation between the grid points and a single point in space. You could also do this with a mesh controller. Empties are just convenient because they won't show up in renders. A second approach involves using a mesh object, again set to relative, and a geometry proximity node using the object as the target. This outputs a distance that we will also use with the compare equals node, right here. In this case, we are comparing against the faces of the controller object, and this has some interesting effects. The scale of the controller now matters. So if I hit S and scale this up or down, you can see that this is having an effect. The effect is also measured relative to the faces, so if there are points inside the object, they might be far enough away to be outside the range of the distortion, which you can see happening right here as I scale in and out. You can use this to achieve some interesting animation effects, almost creating a layer effect. For instance, just moving along. So if I grab this, hit G and Y, you can see that I'm passing through and I'm almost creating a layer where this center is not impacted until it gets close to the edge of the sphere. And if you were going to do something a little more interesting where you reduce the scale of all of these spheres to zero based on the proximity, you would actually be able to hide or show certain aspects or capture the shape of the controller object. 
However, one thing worth noting is for the mesh controller, you want to make sure that it does not appear in your render. You can also change the viewport display by selecting the object, coming down to viewport display, and changing from textured to wired, just so it's a little easier to see what's going on. I personally prefer working with the empty for this specific effect. From here, we can turn to the shader setup. Regardless of which controller we're using, we're going to create variables to assign colors to the spheres based on their proximity to the controller. First, I'm going to store a named attribute set to instance. Importantly, I'm setting all of the attributes to instance because I'm applying them to the instance spheres. The first one is the distance, and this is just the value that we're getting out from either the geometry proximity or the vector map distance node. The second attribute is the minimum value, which I have set to zero for all points in this grid. The next attribute is the maximum distance. And for this, we're simply looking at the distorted positions coming out of our set position node. We're using a attribute statistic and we're capturing the maximum distance. If we were to show this using a viewer node, then we can see in our spreadsheet that the maximum value is roughly around 6.2, depending on where we are. And this is, of course, relative to our controller position. So if I grab the empty and move it around in space, you'll see that this value gets larger or smaller. If we wanted to, we could also set the minimum value using the same attribute statistic node. We'll see in the shading how this works, but the effect is very simple. Namely, right now, if I have a value of zero, then I can drag my controller away and you'll see that the effect eventually falls off and there is no color or distortion. If, however, I set the minimum value using the attribute statistic, then the closest points will always be red. And I don't particularly want that for this case, but there are instances where that could be useful. And that's why right now I have everything set to a value of zero, because I want to be able to move the controller far enough away that I have no effect whatsoever. Let's go over to the shading nodes and see how this all works. The shading setup is relatively simple. We'll use attribute nodes to bring in our geometry nodes distance, min, and maximum attributes. Very importantly, we're going to set the type to instancer, and we're going to use the factor output. We're going to run each of these into a map range node, and before we go any further, I'm going to make a note and say that these are case-sensitive names. So we're going to use the distance as our value, and we're going to define our minimum and maximum range using our min and max values. We're then going to remap whatever that range is from 0 to 1 and use this as the input in a color ramp node. So 0 is going to be red, where the distance is 0, or at a minimum, and the farthest distance is going to be yellow. Because this is a 0 to 1 value, we could also use this to control a number of other aspects of the material, such as the roughness, transmission, or metallic. And if I use this with a viewer node, You'll be able to see the darker values closer to zero, where the controller is effectively right on top of the object, or those specific points. And so if I wanted to, I could make those very specific points ultra glossy, and then this falls off as you get further away. And those are all the basics of setting up geometry proximity that moves both the points and creates custom colors. It's relatively straightforward. To wrap up, we'll quickly run through all the controls in the advanced nodes. The core network is the same as the simple example we just covered. Most of the extra nodes here are just to make everything accessible from the modifier panel and to add in some animation and extra shading controls. Again, a reminder that these nodes are available for free and they're linked in the description. To start, we can control what object we want to scatter inside. So you can see that there's a setting for choosing a specific object or using a default cube. You can also control what object you'd like to scatter inside that object. So again, using the default UV sphere or a specific object, in this case, a cube. You can also change aspects of the grid spacing. So I've put a hard limit on this of 0.2 to stop it from creating too many spaces and overloading Blender, but you can make this smaller or larger at your discretion. And you can also change the specific dimensions in one axis if you want to. In this specific case, we also have controller selection, so you can opt between using the empty or the object for whichever effect you'd like to use. And we have control over the distortion settings, including the distortion range, so the range over which this effect actually takes place relative to our controller object, 
You see we have control over aesthetic things, such as the material, which is by default our proximity material that we generated. We can set shade smooth or shade flat, so obviously I think flat looks a little bit better for cubes. And then we have options for the shader minimum and maximum. So these are extra attributes that effectively allow us to control the spread of the color ramp. So I can make this more concentrated if I want to be a little bit more obvious in a certain region. You could change this using the color ramp as well, but it's just handy to have those controls right here. We have all the same settings for the noise as before, so I can control the distortion strength. I can control the scale and the detail, the roughness, the distortion. I also have the vector math control over the different axes. So if I want this to only go up and down, then I could change this and let's say put one for the Z axis. And there is a speed controller in here as well, because this is set up for animation by default. And so again, pretty much everything that you would need is accessible from the modifier panel here. So you can use these nodes without ever having to actually look at the node network by just coming to the layout tab, grabbing the objects that you want and working with them in this way. And this is available for free. For other great videos detailing proximity distortion, I recommend checking out the Cartesian Caramel channel and Joey Carlino. I've linked a few specific videos that provide further explanations of this effect. And with that, thanks for coming out. As always, I'd like to thank my supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to support the creation of more figure breakdowns and free tools, consider checking it out. If you found this video useful, consider subscribing, sharing with your friends and colleagues, and until next time, you have yourselves a great old day.